Hey, it's Leo. Welcome to my channel and my March wrap up. First of all, I want to thank all of you who have stopped by my last video, which was my first tag video, the hashtag stand with trans kids tag video. And I'm just really excited for the positive comments and the folks who are interested in doing it. Uh, please go check it out and consider yourself tagged. I would love for any trans kid who comes across any of our videos to know that there's just a whole lot of people out here that are rooting for them and care about them and think they're just dang amazing just as they are. I also wanted to show my t-shirt that I got from the Sophie LaBelle site that I talked about last week. Let's see if I can get this for you. says trans kids are part of the team absolutely so i'll link that down below check it out if you're interested with each video i lift up a different nonprofit that's doing good in the world it really is a great reminder to me of all the people out there who are working to make the world a better place i'll make a donation and i encourage you to check them out like share follow or donate as you are inspired today i'm lifting up a nonprofit that is really cool but i found out about it in a kind of funny way uh I'm not yet 50. There's nothing wrong with being 50. But for some reason, uh, AARP, which is the American Association of Retired Persons, I, I believe, is all up in my Instagram feed with their ads. And calm it down. I'll get there when I get there. However, with women's history, they've been lifting up different women-owned businesses or different women leaders and creatives and so forth and i actually have enjoyed that part and this week's lift up comes from one of those posts so they introduced me to black women build which is a baltimore based nonprofit that is helping black women learn carpentry electrical and plumbing work and then they restore vacant homes in west baltimore as a path to home ownership. Black Women Build has a pretty cool origin story. It was founded in 2017 by Shelley Halstead, who believes that for Black women to build intergenerational wealth with the security and prosperity that that can generate, they also needed to learn how to maintain it. They value treating Black women with dignity, they try to address intersectional barriers that prevent Black women from thriving, they train them in skills on how to maintain their home, help help them renovate their home, and then begin that building of community and generational wealth. So I, I think that's fabulous. I'm going to make a donation. I'll encourage you to check them out. So I read 10 books that I'm going to talk about on this video. The first one I read as part of the Black Classics Book Club, which is led by Locked Booktician. Have you checked out this book club yet? Because if not, you certainly should. Every month, there's a different black classic that we all read. Uh, it, they're, you know, classics, so they're, a lot of them are easy to obtain, either library or thrift books or where, wherever you like to, to purchase your books. And then Brie at Locked Booktician has a live at the end of the month with some great discussions. And uh, it's been really a wonderful way to introduce me to some classics, some that I've heard of, some that I haven't, and to have some community to read them in. So for March, we read Lorraine Hansberry's To Be Young, Gifted, and Black. This is her autobiography. Lorraine Hansberry wrote A Raisin in the Sun, which was really pivotal in American theater for theater goers to see Black people in ordinary lives, but, you know, powerful stories. And, you know, that play is still done regularly to this day. Unfortunately, Lorraine Hansberry died at 34 in um, 1965 of pancreatic cancer. So we don't really have a lot more from her. She did do some other plays. And we do have this book, To Be Young, Gifted, and Black, which contains a lot of snippets of plays and letters and um, various writing pieces that were pulled together by her literary executor. And it's just, it's so moving and powerful. And I was so grateful to be able to read uh, these pieces by her. And again, mourned her early passing. You can see there were quite a few places that I just tagged and so many of these were just quotes that really moved me or gave me insight or I just felt were really powerful and I would want to share some with you but I just I think instead I'm going to refer you to please um, go find this book. You can probably get it for pretty inexpensively or at the library and uh, read Lorraine Hansberry. I think that you will be glad that you did. I give this book four and a half stars and I think I'm 
the, it's the reader's fault maybe that I didn't give it five stars. There were, because it was kind of a pulling together of a compilation of writings, there were a few times where I was a little bit confused about what the context of the different pieces. So my only preference would have been for there to have been maybe a little bit more narration about where, what, you know, what the context was for the different pieces or like when it was a play, which play it was from and kind of maybe a little bit about it more. I think it assumed a little bit of knowledge of, of her body of work that I didn't have, um, but don't let that stop you from reading this. This was beautiful and powerful and I'm really glad I read it. So thank you, Brie, and definitely check out her uh, video, which I will link. Oh, I almost forgot. This edition also has a really beautiful forward by James Baldwin, which I recommend as well. The next book I read, I did for March of the Mammoths, and I read this on the audiobook, and that was The Love Songs of W.E.B. Du Bois. This is a new release and debut novel by Honoré Fanon Jeffers and is probably going to win a whole bunch of prizes and deservedly so. I will say that there are a couple things that um, just I wanted to note about this. I, I give this book four and a half stars and these two pieces are the reason why it wouldn't be a five star because otherwise it was just fantastic. The Love Songs of W.E.B. Du Bois is told in dual timeline. It's really the story of Ailey Pearl Garfield, who is a black woman in contemporary times. Um, she's actually just about my contemporary <laughs> and uh, I think a couple years older. The book starts with the kind of older storyline where we meet the ancestors of Ailey in an indigenous family and the there's a black man who comes across their village, who joins them, and uh, they start a family line uh, through that event. And so the we see a few different generations in this timeline as we move towards the present. Then we jump to the present and we start off with Ailey as a four-year-old narrator. And then I think it's four and six and seven. I will say that this was where I, was tempted to DNF it. And I know other reviewers have DNF'd it probably during this section. And I wasn't a fan of the infant narrator or the, you know, the young child narrator. I didn't feel like we really gained anything from that part of the story, but I know that I'm maybe not the target audience. However, I do think maybe we could have, uh, you know, trimmed the book a little bit and have her, the story start when maybe Ailey was 16 or something, but that's neither here nor there because, so yes, I was tempted to DNF it, but at, just at that beginning. But then once I got drawn in, when the story ended, I was not ready for it to end, which I think is pretty remarkable for an over 800 page book. A content warning that I will give is that there are also multiple, multiple storylines about uh, child sexual abuse. And if that is not something that you can read, um, then definitely um, skip this book. I was glad that I was listening to it on audio because there were certain parts of it that I just had to put on really high speed to just catch it, the drift, but just get through those pieces. And so my other critique would be maybe that didn't need to be so much and so often. Um, but that was the author's choice and uh, the, the story is powerful. The, the characters, there are multiple characters who struggle with trauma and the aftermath of trauma and the abuse definitely like impacts multiple women throughout their lives. But that isn't the only storyline, or I would even say that maybe the core storyline. We follow Ailey as she just really comes into her own and she has a lot of struggles, but she also really finds her path. There's so much insight and depth to the storylines about education and classism and colorism and relationships within families and dating and college and learning about HBCUs and studying history and and, and the, the deep spiritual impact when they're studying about slavery and slave history versus, you know, some of the really callous and ignorant and white supremacist attitudes of white people who are studying history of slavery. There's so much, the characters are so well drawn, the dialogue is rich. The, my favorite character was Uncle Root, who was had played a big role in the local HBCU where Ailey winds up going to school. It's just 
powerful, and if it wins all the awards, it deserves all of the awards. Other than the two caveats I mentioned, I think that it's definitely um, a must read. I was just really impressed. It was incredible. The, the, the depth that the characters in the world are drawn and how she just pulls you in deeper and deeper and um, the way it comes together, it's, it's, I just, okay, I'll stop raving. But I recommend it and I give it four and a half stars. I wanna take an interlude here and also recommend a video that I ran across. I was watching yesterday on YouTube, looking for just something to speak to me, I guess, and ran across Rhiannon Giddens video, Cry No More, which was done in 2020. So it's, um, you know, got the, the Zoom pandemic where different musicians are each in their own screen, but the mix, mix is really beautiful. It's dedicated to Breonna Taylor and all black women, and it's, has a uh, solo cellist, Brianna Giddens sings, and then there's also a choir that backs her up. There's a dancer that performs. It's just beautiful. It's incredible. I'm gonna link it down below. Uh, please check it out. The next book I read was Red Lip Theology with a great subtitle for church girls who consider tithing to the beauty supply store when Sunday morning isn't enough. This just came out this year, and this is the memoir of Candace Marie Benbow. And it's also really a love letter to her mother who died uh, too young and who had a real profound impact on the author. And there were so many places where it was really plain the love that they shared even when they quarreled or, or debated. This is a book that I would recommend to people who, uh, particularly if you've grown up in the black church and are looking for a story of someone who journeyed into a faith of um, acceptance and um, sex positivity and LGBTQ plus affirmation. She talks about growing up and um, how her mother was shamed for being an unmarried mother and how strong her mother was and who, how she just drew a line in the sand and would not let that impact how Candace uh, saw herself. Although, you know, obviously then we still pick up messages from society around us. So she still internalized, you know, some of the shame and stuff that comes along with that. She talks about racism and misogyny and academia and trying to find what she's called to and so forth. She says towards the beginning that this is not written for a white audience. So I will refer you to some own voices reviewers of this. But um, again, I think this might really hit the spot for some of you that are looking for this um, sort of story. The next book I read was Mort by Terry Pratchett. And this was part of the Discworld Readathon by Katya by Read, Write, Create, Scott at Gunpowder Fiction and Plot, Kevy at Say Kevy and Rosie Cockshut. And they had a great discussion afterwards. Uh, I'll link that down below as well. And I really am so glad that I had the chance to read this. It was really fun. I gave it four and a half stars. And the, so the the premise behind this book is that on this disc world, this alternative universe, whatever, um, there's this death, per, you know, the picture, the cloak and the scythe and showing up and, you know, escorting the souls to the underworld. And he decides that he needs an apprentice. And part of that is because he kind of wants to take some days off and run around and see what it's like to do human things. He's got this great infatuation with, with all things human that he can't quite understand or, or get right. So he takes on this kid, teenager Mort, who's a gangly kid that asks a lot of questions and um, is pretty endearing and brings him home and teaches him how to do the parts of his job that, or how to do his job, I guess. And uh, Mort, being a teenager, gets a crush on one of the women he's supposed to gather the soul for and doesn't. And so that uh, introduces some problems in the universe. And so the story goes from there. We also meet Mort's daughter, who has been 15 for like 30 plus years because Mort rescued her from, I think, a shipwreck and took her home. And then she's kind of been, she doesn't age because time doesn't pass where death lives. And so there's 
all sorts of drama. There's really great scenes where death is, you know, this trying to be human. Uh, he tries to see what it's like to be drunk and to go fishing. He's just such a great character. And kittens love him and he loves kittens. And so the scenes with death and kittens are just really sweet. Um, and I love the way it all came together at the end. I was really thinking it would go one way, which I, I would have been happy with, but then it ended in a different way, which I would, which was even better than I imagined. So this was a really great uh, cheery book to read. <laughs> cheery, it's about death, but it is. This was a really funny book and um, a great uh, mood lifter in the middle of the month. So I definitely recommend Mort by Terry Pratchett. I then read another really sweet book. It was a little novella, uh, which I mentioned in my last video, and that was A Psalm for the Wild Built by Becky Chambers. I give this one five stars, and I have heard that's in the, the genre of like cozy sci-fi or hope punk, or I don't know, there may be ways to describe it. Basically, it's the story of this tea monk in this planet or moon, um, Penga, where for centuries, humans have had half the planet and the robots have lived in the wilderness on the other half and they have because they have sentience. And this is kind of the agreement that they've come to. And it's not a dystopian future, which is really a pleasant change. Um, but, you know, there's people are people, but there's, you know, good humanity and caring for one another and doing their jobs. And, and um, this tea monk who is non-binary is um searching for something and so goes out into the wilderness where they then meet a robot who is also coming to ask questions of humans of what would make you happy and so the tea monk and the robot go on a little journey together and it's just really beautiful and profound and um, i enjoyed it and recommend it um, especially if you're wrestling with like what is your purpose or yeah how to take care of yourself in the midst of all of that's going on around us. Um, I mean, it's not like so deep, it's gonna solve all your problems, but I think you'll enjoy it. So I definitely recommend that you check it out. The next book that I read, I did a buddy read with Bob the Booker, my booktube nemesis. <laughs> And we thought maybe this would be the book that would cure the nemesis curse, but sadly it didn't quite. I read this at the recommendation of, of Kevy at Say Kevy, and I'll say I give it four stars, but it's not really a Leo book maybe. Um, and I think part of that may be the, the narrator is a little bit unlikable. He's on this journey of potentially understanding himself to be trans and he's trying to figure that out. He definitely comes from a lot of privilege and has some attitudes that go along with that. I think also because of that, I just, it's written first person kind of narrative. We never really get outside of Daryl's head. We don't get other perspectives. We don't meet other people other than through Daryl's kind of like almost rambling journal style perceptions of them. Honestly, if I hadn't been buddy reading this with Bob, I don't know that I would have finished it, even though it's not that long of a read. Um, so that did help me get through. And you know, the ending there was, I felt there was some emotional payoff and I appreciated it. But um, this, yeah, this wasn't a fave for me, but um, some of you may enjoy it. And I know several of you already have read it and loved it and call it the best book of the year. So we don't all have to agree. I didn't even tell you what it's about. <laughs> That's maybe because um, Daryl is about a guy who is a cuck, which was his kink, which means that he he gets off on having other people have sex with his wife. And then he kind of goes on this journey of, you know, is that satisfying him? And who is he really? And what is his gender? And is he trans? And, and so forth. So um, that's what this is about. If that sounds interesting to you, definitely check it out. I would love to know your thoughts on it. The next book that I read was The Sentence by Louise Erdrich. And this was a four and a half star read for me. This is a really clever and well-written book that has so many layers and a lot of really profound bits that had you thinking twice about. Uh, it's the story of Tuki who it starts out with this really comic caper where she steals a dead body for her crush because it's her lover from that, from the wife. I don't know, it's conv convoluted. That winds up with her going into jail. Then she is released from jail and winds up working at this bookstore where 
one of the customers dies and then haunts the bookstore. I've seen some reviews or the blurb that calls it a wickedly funny ghost story. I don't, I don't know that I would refer to it in that way. The I mean, there is a haunting. It isn't particularly a humorous haunting, I wouldn't say. I would say that there's funny stuff that happens, but there's also like the, the storyline of the book follows the pandemic, follows the George Floyd protests and Black Lives Matter protests in Minneapolis. There's um, a lot of wrestling with what that means. You know, so reading some of the pandemic stuff was a little bit close to home in terms of, you know, her, as a part of the bookstore, they had people that were out on tour and then they had to, they made the decision to cancel and then, then looking for sanitizer and toilet paper. And this was before we knew where to, how to wear masks and like all of that. And it just, it was, it was great. And I think re rereading that in a few years will be even more powerful, but some of that part was a little bit close to home. And that's probably partly why I gave it a four and a half star instead of a five star. But there's just really great meditations on love and family and motherhood and tradition and books and the power of reading and how we care for and remember the dead. The ending was really profound and I'm really glad that I read this. So I would love to know your thoughts on this. I know lots of other people have read it. Um, this is my first Erdrich book and definitely going to read more of her. Her writing is beautiful and phenomenal. Another beautiful and phenomenal book that I read was The Seed Keeper by Diane Wilson, and I'm going to give this one five stars. This one is also about indigenous character. I forgot to mention that Louise Erdrich's book is set with indigenous characters. Tuki, the protagonist, is indigenous, as is her husband and the owner of the bookstore, who is based on the author, who is also indigenous. In this case as well, we have um, the Seed Keeper follows a Dakota family. This is the story of Rosalie Ironwing, and we have a couple different timelines for her. We have the present day, and then we have her as a teenager, as well as her as a child growing up. And then there's some perspectives from some of her great grandmothers, I believe, our ancestors. Um, timeline. Rosalie Ironwing was raised by her father. He was a science teacher that then I uh, wound up quitting that job because the school wasn't allowing him to speak about indigenous ways. And so he, they lived kind of out in the woods and he taught her a lot about plants and the stars and so forth. And then unfortunately he died of a heart attack uh, when she was 10 and she that I believe 10. And then she is taken into the foster care system and doesn't have a good experience with that and then winds up meeting this white farmer who she marries and then at the beginning of the book we learn that she's also now a widow and she leaves the family farm that she had with her husband and goes back home to that cabin where she grew up as a small child and so then she has a, some real introspective time and there's a timeline that goes along up there this is just really powerful so beautiful there's themes of family and identity and belonging. There is some discussion of the colonization and genocide and boarding schools that happened to the Dakota peoples. But the focus is also on just the strength and the power of the women in these families and what they have done to preserve both their families and the seeds and what that means to preserve the seeds. There's also a way that that weaves in with, you know, the seed companies who are doing genetically modified stuff that's kind of tied in with the pesticides and the damage that that does to the earth and to the people and how that can be harmful to health and so forth. Um, the, the ending, the, the, the story arc for Rosalie herself is just so powerful and beautiful. And I read that and just said, wow. So I'd recommend it. If you read it, I would love to know your thoughts on it because I don't know that I've had a chance to talk to anyone who has read this one yet. The next book I read, I read for middle grade March, and this is Healer of the Water Monster by Brian Young. This is the story of Nathan who goes to visit his grandmother on the reservation in Arizona over the summer. And he 
chooses to spend the time with her for the summer in part because his parents have divorced and his father has a new girlfriend and he does not want to spend the summer with his father and the new girlfriend. Besides, Nathan really enjoys his grandma and he's hopeful to get to spend some time this summer with his uncle Jet as well. One night at the beginning of his stay at his grandma's, he goes outside to go to that outhouse and then kind of gets turned around and gets lost and winds up meeting this water monster, which is a holy being from Navajo tradition. But the water monster is suffering and sick and so asks Nathan if he will heal him. And so then Nathan begins this journey of trying to figure out what it means to heal the water monster and if that's possible. Once his uncle Jet comes, realize that he's wrestling with a lot of stuff that he needs healing from as well. And so they have that storyline of how, how can you help Jet, who is struggling with PTSD from the war, as well as some alcoholism. And um, those two storylines converge. And it's just, it's so beautiful and powerful. It's also very relevant to today. His mother is, um, the reason he's not spending his summer with his mother is because she is a journalist covering the um, Dakota Pipeline protests and they talk about you know water as life and so forth which ties into the water monster so i give this one five stars i definitely recommend you read it especially if you you know love adventures and journeys and heartfelt stories with a bit of climate justice and a conversation about that as well and um, if you have any middle school kids that you could recommend this to i think uh, that would be really great for them to enjoy as well um, there's also in the back a link where you can listen to the navajo version of the story there's a lot of navajo in here as well as a glossary and the author is navajo himself Okay, the last book that I read was actually the first book that I read in March, and that is She Who Became the Sun by Shelley Parker Chan. And with this one, I, I had heard some people say that they thought there was too much about the war and battles and that part became boring, but I thought I would give it a try. This is the story of, it's a reimagining of the first emperor of the Ming Dynasty as a character that's assigned female at birth, but then I'm not sure if they're... Uh, non-binary or trans masculine or um, exactly how they identify but it's definitely queer representation and a queer love story and I really thought the writing was beautiful and the world building and exquisite um, there's some really interesting stuff for me I give it four stars because again it's a me problem but I'm not interested in characters with an a story arc that takes them away from goodness so i have just a, it's minor it's not really spoiler but if you don't want to know anything you know skip to the end um the protagonist starts the story as a peasant in 1345 um in china and they're under the um mongol rule and dying from a huge famine where the, fa the family has all died you know, many, many people have died, but Zhu Chongba, they survive and they go and present themselves to the monastery, taking on their brother's identity to, in order to survive. Our protagonist is a strong character. We really enjoy getting to know them, but I just didn't enjoy reading about a character whose ambition eclipse their humanity. I feel like we have enough of that in the real world. I know they're a queer character and I feel like maybe I should then root for them, but you know, there's violence that they commit in the name of wanting to be the most powerful, wanting to be remembered from generation to generation. That's just not the kind of storyline or character arc that I'm interested in, so I won't read it more, but I know that this is a very popular book. Again, the writing is beautiful and I appreciate what the author was doing with the storyline. Um, so maybe you'll enjoy it better than I did. Well, that's it. Thanks for making it to the end of the video. I hope you are doing well and hanging in there. Um, here in the US, it's spring and in my city, um, it has been beautiful today. I am really excited to be repotting some of the plants on my balcony and putting them in little bigger pot, bigger pots. And my blueberries are flowering. So maybe we'll have some balcony blueberries again. Spring makes me hopeful even in the midst of all of the not so hopeful things in the world and all of you 
I'm just so grateful for this community and the fantastic connections that we're making here and the gift that all of you are to the booktube community and the broader world. So maybe it's the sunshine, but that's me gushing a little bit. So um, please feel free to like, subscribe, and share, comment down below. And again, please check out my hashtag stand with trans kids book tag um, previous video. And I'd love for you to do that tag and let's just get that tag everywhere and um, or find your own way to stand with trans kids and say we love you and affirm you. So anyway, with that, I'll let you go. Until next time, happy reading.